like wrap yourself up in your blanket and not come yes. from under it type cold. Yes. Amen. But I'm grateful that you braved the cold and made it to God's house this morning. I'm sorry I have to inform you, but after some further developments going on early this morning, I have decided that I am no longer capable of pastor in this church. There are some here who just refuse. They refuse to listen to the Lord, to me, or anything else. So I want to make sure I pray and leave y'all in great hands. But uh, this is going to be my last Sunday. I'll miss my call. I, I just kid. If you would stand on your feet this morning, would you do me a favor? You've been doing some of this already, but would you just greet somebody? Greet two or three people. Tell them good morning. Tell them good morning. Tell them. See them. so ready. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to sing um, Emmanuel. And we know that Emmanuel means God is with us. Amen. 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 It's December. Hallelujah. Amen. We made it this far. Somebody needs to be grateful. Just clap your hands. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Because we made it to another December. And I'm so grateful. I don't know about you that I know that God is with me. Amen. Amen. So Emmanuel. Bless you. Come on, join in with us. If you're not a singer, that means you're a dancer today. <laughs> you can rock a little bit, clap a little bit. Join in. It says, come. Come. Come, let us. Come, let us adore him.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. 
Let me read these few verses in your ears if you don't mind. It says, and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regard for the humble faith of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The grass may fade, the flower may wither away, but your word stands forever. Speak. Yes, God. Let your scriptures speak to us. May they saturate our soul, transform our minds, activate our hands to actively serve you, our great king. May you use this time, Lord, to not only comfort but to convict, not only to bring clarity, Lord, but to challenge us and champion us to be more like your son, Jesus. Yes, God. Most of all, may we celebrate him in this season like we've never celebrated him before because he's worthy of all of our praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> you may be seated. A man whose devotional I like to read named A.W. Tyler said this, worship also means to express in some appropriate manner what you feel. In other words, worship is balanced. It's not just how we live, although worship is a lifestyle, meaning a life that we seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But also worship is an expression. It's are giving back and speaking out and celebrating God and Jesus, our King, for who they are. And I would suggest there are a few of us who might struggle once you get to heaven because when you read all the revelation, you will find that the angels and those who have gone before <coughs> us will be in God's presence and at the foot of the throne where Jesus sits and worshiping and singing and crying holy, holy. In other words, heaven will be a little noisy for yes. those of you who are a little bit quiet. <laughs> and what I find is, and we get into this, what is most interesting is we make noise about things we care about. Mm. If I get a group of men together that like football, all it takes is three or four and you will have enough ruckus to fill a home. If I get a few ladies together at the right store with the right sale at the right time with the right size. Say it. Yeah. Amen. They could they ready to move right now? <coughs> Sound good. But there's something about worship that God desires of us. He made us to glorify him. He told us in Exodus that I will have no God before me. I am God and God all by myself. And Mary, who we'll dig into this morning, had experienced this great God. She had experienced him as a young lady, because keep in mind, when this text is written, and she is told by the angel, Gabriel, that she will be having Jesus, the Messiah, the awaited one, the Savior of the world, she is a young teenager. But she trusts God enough, as we talked about last week, to make a move, to visit her sister Elizabeth, to travel 80 to 100 miles, walk three or four days, uh, no Uber, no flights, no bus, no Amtrak, walked pregnant, early on stages pregnant because she believed God. They conversed together, and the conversion of them coming together and the conversation was so significant and so great that it led her to write this song. She says to us through this song where her soul really feels. She leads us to a place of worship. She has walked with God. She's trusted God. She's believed God. And she says, now that I see for myself how good and how great our God is, there's something on the inside of me that is crying out to express to him how good he is. Yeah. 
And I don't know about you, but really every Sunday morning should be filled for us with a time of giving expression of how good God is. If you don't believe he's good, let me give you a few things to think about. How do you think you made it from last Sunday to this Sunday? Yes, who, yes. who do you think watched over you when you drove your Thank car? You, who do you think keeps the lights on in your house? Who do you think provides for you? Who do you think gives you food to eat? Who do you think keeps your heart pumping? Who do you think taps you this morning and got you up? Yes. It wasn't your alarm clock. It wasn't the sunlight coming through your window. It wasn't that noise that was made in your house that you do not like. It was God who decided it was time for you and I to get up. And so, because he's just that good, and just because he is who he is, he deserves our worship. We're going to look at this. The first few verses tell us, watch this, how the Mary worshipped him individually. Verse 46 says, and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. That word exalt means to magnify. Catch this, no pun intended. It really means in Greek to make great. Yeah, people want to holler about making a country great. God ain't never worried about a country being great. He said, I am great. You'll catch that later when you watch the news. <laughs> But the word exalt means to magnify. It means to enlarge. It means to make known and to make seen. So Mary says, in essence, my soul, meaning the inner part of me, the part that is on the inside of me, my innermost being, that, that place where only I know what I think and I really feel, and the only other person who knows is God. That place on the inside of me is exalting the Lord. Lord meaning one who is master of all. She says, my soul magnifies my master. It exalts him. It makes him great. Why do I make him great? She goes on to tell us why she makes him great. In verse 47, she says, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. Not only is he my master, but he is my savior. In other words, she understands who she really is. She didn't get high lifted up like some of us Get in church for a few minutes, learn a few scriptures. Now we're more holy than everybody. Forgetting what we just did a week before we got saved. That wasn't Mary. Mary said, God bless me in such a way that I understand that he's not only allowing me to carry the Savior, but he is my Savior. The word save means to deliver, means to get out of trouble. It means to pull or snatch out of a trying circumstance. In other words, Mary says, I understand that even though I'm young in my life and I'm carrying Jesus on the inside of me, there's going to be some stuff that happens in my life that I'm going to need him to step up and deliver me from. Could you imagine for a moment being a mother carrying the Savior of the world? You're carrying him, but one day he's going to carry you. <laughs> You, you gonna wipe his tears away one day, but one day he gonna wipe your tears away. One, one day you gonna feed him, but when he get grown, he gonna feed you. Yeah, it's that that she says, this is my savior. He, he is my God. And she says, because he's my God, I have a reason to rejoice. Can I tell you that word rejoice is in the present tense, which simply means this, that it is continuous. It's not one time. Can I tell you something else that not only is it continuous, but it's not based on circumstance. In other words, the worship of our Lord, our King, our God is not based on how we feel, what we have, what we don't have. It's not based on if I feel well today or sick today. It's not based on if I got enough money to pay my bills or not enough money to pay my bills. It's not based on if I like my job or dislike my job. It's not based on if I like my spouse right now or dislike my spouse. It's not based on how my kids are doing and how they're making me feel. Worship, watch this, is simply based off the fact that God is great and he's worthy to be praised. I wish I had a few people who could identify with right now and say my life is not what I want it to be. I don't have all that I need. Matter of fact, I'm troubled and pressed and perplexed on every side, but yet I remember like Paul, even though I am tried, I am in distress, but I'm not in despair. I am perplexed but I am not forgotten. I might be cast down, but I'm not forsaken because I serve a God, watch this, who will deliver me when the time is right. Here it is. So why sometimes is it hard to worship? Because can you be real? Sometimes life is hard. Anybody know life is hard? Yeah, yeah. I, I, there are some people that I wish I could go back and see when I first got baptized and tell them they lied to me. <laughs> 
they lied to me because they said to me in essence that I was going to be made brand new. I was going to come out of the water. I was going to be different. You know, that song that says I look at my hands and my hands look new and I look at my feet and my feet look new. And it only took me a few hours when I got home to discover I had the same old ashy feet and the same <laughs> hands. That were capable of doing anything lest the Holy Spirit restrain yes. me. I wish I could go back and tell them that they didn't tell me that life sometimes get harder once you become his before it gets easier. I wish I could go back to them and tell them they lied and then tell me that I will still have some midnights and it would seem like it was going to last forever until he stepped in right in the nigga time. I wish I could go back and tell them. They didn't tell me the full truth that even in church people would dislike me, discredit me, did try to destroy me and God would still deliver me. I wish I could go back and tell them that they didn't tell me that you're not going to always want to worship him but you always need to worship him because he's worthy to be worshipped. But here's the one thing they did do. Here's the one thing they did do. I don't want to do more minutes and I'm out of your way. The one thing they did do is, is teach me who Jesus is. And we're living in a day and age where everybody says they know something about Jesus, but when you really peel it back, we don't always believe the same thing. We started last week, we talked about Buddhism, and we talked about Jehovah Witnesses, and we talked a little bit about Hinduism. But this morning, I want to point out right here, because since she says, my Lord is who she exalts, and she talks about God being her Savior, she's talking about Jesus, the God-man, 100% deity, 100% human. He's wrapped in human flesh, but yet he's still he's all true. God. Yeah. He's one who experienced temptation just like we do, but yet was without sin. Yeah. In fact, when he faced temptation, in Matthew chapter 4 after being out for 40 days fast and he was hungry and Satan tried to get him to worship another God. He said, I will have no other God before me. I will worship the one and true living God. So who is this Jesus in comparison to some in society? Because there are some folk in society that I love, but I have to tell them when they talk about Jesus, we ain't talking about the same person. One of those groups is Islam. They, they, they look at Jesus. Jesus is not God. He's, he's, he's not the son of God. He's just a man who lived a sinless life and performed a few miracles and they believe at some point he may come back to earth to represent Muhammad to possibly lead Christians over. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe in God existing in three persons. They believe in one God and they believe because we believe in the Trinity that we really worship three gods. So therefore Jesus is not God to them and they see us in highlight and contempt of who God really is. So when I start talking to someone who has that kind of background, or you do, please understand, they don't see Jesus as the Son of God. They don't even see him as a God at all. They just see him as a man who lived and who died. But not only them, my, my friends, I have some. I do. They're my friends. But we have to respectfully disagree that are in the nation of Islam who who will teach on the surface that Jesus was a great prophet, but behind closed doors they will tell you that Jesus was born, watch this, in a adulterous relationship, that somehow some man got together with some woman and they birthed Jesus and he lived life on earth. He was a great prophet, sent by Allah, according to them, who was, watch this, full of mercy, did some good stuff, but still not worthy of taking care of our sins. So I have to respectfully disagree with them because if Jesus is just a prophet walking around and he was born in a relationship that was on earth between Mary and Joseph, and by the way, they believe Joseph was already married, so in other words, they're saying Jesus was birthed out of an adulterous relationship. If that's who Jesus is, then all of us are in trouble because then none of our sins are covered and all of us are damned, or shall I say damned, not in a bad way, to go to hell. But that's not who Jesus is. And then I have some friends who are Hebrew Israelites who have taken on Deuteronomy 
and the last verse of chapter 28 to mean that was pointing futuristically, prophetically to the transatlantic slave trade where many of us persons of color in this room, our ancestors ended up here and that was the Bible predicting it and therefore there are many of us who are considered the real Jews. Here's the problem what I have what they teach. They don't teach that Jesus is the son of God. They don't teach that Jesus was really important at all. They believe you can live out the Old Testament and fulfill all the laws in Deuteronomy 28 as well as Leviticus 26. The only issue I have is have you ever read Leviticus? Because when you read Leviticus, it talks about all the different sacrifices. So the problem I have with that is if, if, if we can live righteous on our own and, and, and don't need a savior, then where are the animals if you're going to follow Leviticus 26? Because there are a whole lot of sacrifices throughout the book of of Leviticus, you're going to need a whole lot of animals. You're going to need a place to sacrifice. Um, you, you're going to need some help maintaining all the laws and the principles in the Old Testament. That's why we needed a Savior. We needed someone who could come and watch this, not do away with the law, but who could fulfill the law. We needed somebody who could keep what we couldn't keep. We needed somebody who could pay a price that we could not pay. And we all, watch this, need somebody to redeem us from our sins. Can I help you, especially if you are spiritually elite? Can I help you? Because Romans says that all, A-L-L, -L, not yes, some yes, of us, yes. not a few of us, yes. not those who may think we're better than others, but A-L-L, -L, all, meaning with your spiritual, lovely, wonderful self, you sinned at least once in your life. And it says all that have sinned, oh, I need of a savior. And I'm glad today, let me come back, I have not lost my place in this text. I'm glad that Mary says that God is my savior. In other words, she understands that I am a sinful human being in need of a savior. I cannot save myself. Matter of fact, I can't get myself out of what I've got myself in. As young as I am, she understands I need somebody to save me and that's what makes her worship. Can I help you and me in here this morning? What would make you worship too is when you understand that Jesus really did pay it all. Yes. When you start looking at your own spiritual resume and understand the stuff that he got you out of. I ain't talking about the stuff that everybody know. I'm talking about that private stuff he got you out of that you ain't never talked about. That you ain't never told anybody about. The times where he showed up when you was by yourself and you thought I'm going to not make it because I don't have anybody and he showed you as long as you got him he's all that you need. I wish I had a few people who were honest enough to say that you live life long enough to discover that you've done some stuff and you're grateful that Jesus covered it. I wish I had some people in here who would be honest enough to say I ain't always got it right. I can be a trip. Matter of fact, without Jesus, I'm a hot mess. And if he don't step up and make ministry out of my mess and give me a mission, I would be miserable. So Mary says, my soul Exhaust this Jesus, the one who's the savior of the world. This Jesus, who Hebrews talk about, who is the new and improved and better. Watch this sacrifice, who sacrificed once and for all, that covered all that we would ever do, both now and in the future. Aren't you glad that Jesus policy about how he treated sin took care of all sin. Even the stuff you would do in the future. Jesus said, I got that too. Even the stuff that we would do once we accepted him as Savior. He said, look, I know sanctification is progressive. I know that even though you said you confess me, that you're going to slip sometimes, you're going to fall sometimes, you're going to get it wrong sometimes, you're going to do it not only wrong, you're going to plan to do wrong. Oh, yeah, look at me. Don't look at your neighbor. <laughs> he, he knew that sometimes it wasn't just I didn't read it. I didn't see that in the scripture. No, it was I knew my plan was wrong, but it felt so right at the time. Anybody ever think of a plan and it sounds so good at the time and you picked up your Bible and you the first verse you read let you know your plan was wrong? <laughs> But she understands who she is. She's rejoicing. It is continuous. It's not only her lifestyle to live according to the scriptures, but it's her lifestyle to open her mouth. Mary is not ashamed of who God is. Therefore, she's willing to express her love for him. Come here, somebody. How would you feel if somebody always handed to somebody else that they loved you but never told you? Would you feel love? 
Or better yet, you married to somebody, but they'll never come home. <laughs> but y'all married. Can I tell you, when we don't give God worship, it's the same empty experience. When we walk around as if, watch this, we deserve what we have versus throwing it all back at his feet saying, God, we are really not worthy of what we have, yes. but we only have it because yes. you gave it to us. Yes. That's when, watch this, pride is not only accepting credit for what you didn't do, but it's also not acknowledging the fact of the gift he gave you. And so Mary says, here, I rejoice continuously because he's worthy of that rejoicing. But here's the part that I love. When she gets to verse 48, she says, for he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. That, that word bond slave will, will mess us up because it really means, in original language, female slave. She's calling herself a slave to him. It deals with that, that, that nasty S word, submission. How many of you know submission just ain't your thing? <laughs> Ooh, look at how many of y'all put your hands down. I can't wait to watch this. I'm going to say it again. Let's be honest. I'm trying to help you get delivered. <laughs> how many of you know that S word, submission, ain't your thing? Yeah, at least we got like 10% to be honest. <laughs> How many of you know there are certain things you can submit on and other things, if it just don't make sense to you, you just can't sum about it. If the X's and O's don't line up, if the plan don't figure up right, if it's missing some details, how many of you will say real quick, that sounds real good, but that ain't for me. <laughs> but can I tell you how God works when he came to Mary and Mary is able to say this freely? She didn't really understand how she was going to meet with child, but she just trusted that God was going to produce a baby and the baby was going to be the Messiah. Most of us, if that had been us, we'd have had, we'd still be talking. The text would read how many questions we asked God after he said it. Well, if I'm going to get pregnant, when? Right. <laughs> and where am I going to be? And who going to help me take care of this baby? And who going to tell Joseph? Because we ain't married yet. And we live in a culture, watch this, where if I come out pregnant, I can get stoned. So who going to hold the stoners away? Who going to decorate the room? Who going to pay the insurance? How am I going to get there? What hospital am I going to be in? Do they got nice rooms or is this just, just makeshift? I, I think, how many of you know you would have had a ton of questions? Whereas Mary just said, I am submissive to you. Matter of fact, I don't know how it's going to come together. I don't know when. I don't know where. I just know that I'm carrying Jesus. And however you decide to do it, God, that's enough for me. When you get to that place, you can worship God freely because you understand you don't have to worry about the details. You don't have to worry about the steps. You don't have to worry about the goals, tasks, items. Come here, my task. That's right, it's task one. Uh, Jesus is working. <laughs> task two, what is he going to wear home from the hospital? <laughs> task three, who going to be there to let us in the house? Task four, what is he going to eat? But when God gets to moving and doing things, can I tell you, he moves without detail. So Mary says, here, I am submissive to you. I am a slave to you, which means whatever you want to do with my life, you can do it. I serve you, I worship you, I love you, and I trust you enough to handle the affairs of my life. Can I tell you why some of us don't sleep, don't eat right, don't walk right? It's because we're too busy trying to figure out things that God didn't ask us to figure out. He said, just trust me. Let me take care of the details. You walk, I guide. You wow. listen, I'll, I'll write it down. You take care of me. And I'll take care of you. Mary said, I'm humble enough to trust you to do it. But here's the part I really love. She says in verse 49, and I'm almost out of your way. She says, for the mighty one has done great things for me. <laughs> the mighty one. She, 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 she talks and says the language, that word mighty is the same Prayer of this comes from the same root as the word exalt, meaning to magnify. She says, my mighty God who I exalt has done great things. Notice she didn't minimize God or bring God down on a level or say, watch this, I'm going to give God worship when God does what I like. She says, my God has done great things. Can you catch this for a moment? Mary wasn't somebody walking around looking for a child. 
She wasn't asking to be pregnant. She surely wasn't asking to carry the Savior of the world. But she says, my God has done great things. She says, in other words, that I understand that what God is doing in my life is nothing small. It is major. And my God has done great things. I think sometimes we struggle, especially when it comes to worship, because we look at what God does as small until he does something big and we worship him for a little while. And then when the bigness and the appeal of it wears off, we go back to business as usual. But if we could get an elevated look into the fact that God sits high and we sit low, and yet as they sung this morning, Emmanuel, that God came and dwelt among us, that God left heaven's best to come amongst earth's worst yeah. to make sure that we would have a way back to him. I think all of us, if we think about it, could think about the fact that God has done great, great things. Yes. Okay, okay, you're looking at me like you, you don't catch what I'm saying. Um, 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 if, if God has ever, watched this, provided for you when you couldn't provide for yourself, I think he's done great things. Great things. I think if God has allowed you to defy any doctor's report, yes. when they said you wasn't going to make it, he has done great things. Great things. Hallelujah. I think that if you've been through a bunch of crazy stuff and you yes. still got half a mind, glory, 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 glory. that God has done great things. Great things. Yes. I think if you've been in yes. enough trouble where you knew it should have been over yes. and you shouldn't even be sitting in a red chair this morning, that yet you're here and you don't look like what you've been through, yes. I think God has done great things. Great things. Yes. I think that if your heart is beating and the blood is flowing through your body and you can open up your mouth and you can talk and you can do what you want to do when you get ready to do it. I think God has done great, great things. things. Yes. Maybe you think you deserve what you have, but can I tell you, the Bible says none of us deserve nothing that we have. Yes. It's only by his grace that we got it. If you know you're living somewhere you shouldn't because of your credit, if you know you got something that you shouldn't have got because you didn't have enough money to pay for it, if you know that he's taking care of you and open doors that you can open, I believe you should be able to say that my God has done great things. travel when you want to. That's a different kind of worship. Because in our minds we start thinking, I'm good. I'm all right. If I pray today, it's okay. I'm already up. So you stay up and do sometimes like I do. I'm guilty. Lord, thank you for waking me up. And I'm gone. But when you get in trouble, Somebody look at me. Don't look at your neighbor because I don't want to expose you before Christmas because they might be thinking about a gift for you. But look at me. When you get in trouble, when life is hard, when life is unfair, when you know you've made a mistake, I ain't talking about I think I did something wrong. I'm talking about I know I did something wrong. All of a sudden, you run in church a whole different kind of way. Because when you need him, you call out loud and watch this. You don't worry about who watching. That's how I know when the house is on fire. When you come in and you don't care who watching and you clap and you rock and you're off key and you don't care. You keep singing when the music team done. <laughs> because the house is on fire, we worship differently. Here's what I'm trying to say. From this song we learn about Mary, Mary said, I don't know what the future holds. I don't know when I'm going to have this baby. I don't know if Joseph going to rock with me or not after he find out I'm pregnant. And, and, and he is. And he got to raise another man's baby. I don't 
don't know what my life conditions are going to look like. I don't know how the world is going to treat me because I'm having a baby and technically it's out of wedlock. I don't know how all the pieces are going to come together. But come what will, I'm going to worship my God because he has done. My grandmother helps me with this and I'm, I'm really out of your way. When, when, when we were small, my grandmother had this thing that she called shaking cabinets. Because most of us as grandkids, we would tend to let us deep in her house. Plus she had an in-home daycare center. So she had the neighborhood kids and she had her grandkids. And all of us would eat. So when dinner time came, I was the most inquisitive grandchild. So I'm counting heads. Each day I'm counting. About 15 years. That don't even include grandma and grandpa. So, man, that's 18. How we gonna eat? So, while everybody else was playing, I'm planning my plate. <laughs> I know y'all more spiritual. Y'all were just saying the Lord would provide. I'm planning my plate. So, y'all play. I'm gonna be first when she say dinner ready. So, I would slide up next to her and say, I see how many people it is here today. And uh let's go eat. And when I would say that to her, she wouldn't respond right away. Most times she would just start singing and begin checking cabinets for what was in there. And it always seemed to me when she would open a cabinet, her kitchen went around like this in a rectangle and each side of the kitchen had cabinets and they all had different stuff in them. And so it always seemed to me it was never enough in there. So I asked, yeah, Grandma, how we gonna eat in here? It's, it's a lot of us. And every now and then she would say, boy, go play. And I'm thinking, no, I can't play. I got to figure out how we gonna eat. <laughs> we can play afterwards. She would keep singing. My grandmother was a singer. She, she sang in the choir. She, she loved music. She would sing all the time. So she would be singing some gospel song and just walking. And then finally she would say, well, walk with me. Let me show you something. And so we would walk around the kitchen and she would just start pulling out stuff. And then somewhere in there, it always seemed to me that whatever song she was singing would be talking about how God provides. I think she just added in lyrics. I don't think every song she <laughs> was there. <laughs> I would never tell her that to her face. <laughs> but it just seemed to me, we'd walk around and she would say, just follow me. And she would start singing and she would just be pulling out stuff. And she would say, come with me over here and get this. And go in the refrigerator and get that. And go to that cabinet and pull this out. And it would amaze me because she knew what everything was. And she always believed, no matter how many people were there that day, that God was going to have enough. And so finally, when I became a teenager, she was doing this. And I, you know, I, I'm 16, 17 years old. I'm like, look, now, now you got to tell me what's really going on because how do, do you just buy enough anticipating that we're coming? Or do you sneak and tell Grandpa to go to the store while I ain't watching? Because I, like many of you, I'm inquisitive. I need to know. I need to know the details. I need to understand what plan is going to be executed up in here. Because now I'm driving. So if necessary, I'm going to get in my car and go buy something to eat. But I ain't going to be without no food. So tell me, how do you do this? How do you make this work? And she would say to me, look, you got to understand something. That, that the God that I serve and worship, I worship him whether I got plenty or I don't have enough. And she said, as I worship, God seemingly reminds me of where stuff is. So as he reminds me where it is, it always seems to be enough to take care of y'all. And she then looked me square in the eye and she said to me, you got to understand something. Instead of worrying and trying to walk out your own plans and your problems, you need to put them in God's hands and worship. Because when you put them in God's hands and worship, it reminds him of how much you trust him. Amen. 
He said, she told me, she said, it activates some things that I cannot explain, but God always promised that I would never leave you nor forsake you, that I would provide for you when no one else would. So as I worship, I don't worry about what's in the cabinet because I know my God will give me enough. What am I saying? Some of you are in here, you got anxiety, you got depression, you got I can't sleep, you got trouble on every side. I dare you to just start walking and not worrying about what's in front of you, not worrying about what's behind you, not worrying about who's going to be there, and just worship the one who's shown you all your life that he's never left you. That's what Mary shows us today when she writes this song. That's why the rest of the verses she moves from an individual praise to corporate. She says, God scatters my enemies. How many of you know God has a better revenge plan than you, than you can ever create? Amen. He said, vengeance is mine. I shall repay. He says, I'll scatter. He scatters my enemies. He turns the rich to the poor and the poor to the rich. She says, he remembers his covenant with Abraham. She's talking about the story where Abraham was getting ready to sacrifice his own son because God had told him to. And in the ninth hour, God provides. He showed how much he trusted. And God remembered his promise. She says all of this because she has a true sense of what worship is. So here's what I'm going to ask you to think about. We're going to stop right there and continue this into next week. But here's what I want you to think about. What stands in your way? of being able to give God the worship he deserves. What problem, what person, what pain, what plan? And I would argue that most of us, what stands in the way of giving God all our worship is our plan. Because we say, God, if you just line up with what I got on paper, Life for us will be good. I got to say, God is calling you, some of you, to walk in a completely different direction and do some radical stuff that you go in. Mm -mm. Or you say, I need more prayer about that first. And you're talking to people and you want them to confirm what they can't. Because only God can. Notice, Mary didn't go to Elizabeth's house for her to tell her that she was carrying the Messiah. She went to Elizabeth's house to encourage Elizabeth for what God was already doing in her life. I think God is calling some of us here to some radical type of trust. And before we pray, can I ask you this question? How many of you know you got trust issues? It's okay. How many of you know the first thing you'll say, the one I can depend on is the one I look at in the mirror? <laughs> can I tell you that God is standing right beside you when you look at that very going? Yes. Who made you in the first place? Yes. <laughs> Who provided a mirror for you to have to look at? It was me. You will take a moment. Relationship, relationship builds worship. Mary is an example of that today for us. And when you have a clear picture of who Jesus is, and when you begin to trust him in a radical type way, you begin to place all things in his hands. So I'm going to pray because I know some of us, we pray, we put some stuff in his hands. But then other things, we say, God, I got this. Mm -hmm. We don't say those words. But we say, God, you take care of this part, and I'm going to take care of this part. Mm -hmm. God said, no, I want all of you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we get to serve you. 
that we get to worship you. For there is no one like you. So God, help us to trust, to lean, to depend, to be reminded that you've already been doing great things in our lives. Lord, for some of us, this season of life is difficult. Mm -hmm. This time of year is hard. For others of us, Lord, we just trying to figure out life in general. Mm -hmm. And this month is just another month to us of life being life. But God, wherever we are, may we just worship you and Hi. worship our way through to whatever it is you have next. May we be reminded that through Mary, you still do the miraculous. That God, you are still worthy to be worshipped because of awe and reverence. Because you are holy and you are merciful. Because there is no one like you. Yes, God. God, most of all, can you help us surrender whatever it is about us that we still hold on to? Can we give it all to you today? Can we lay it all at your feet today? Can we begin to make room for you in our lives? Most of all, Lord, the person's hand I'm, I'm holding, I, I don't know what you're staring up in there. But Lord, may we all be stirred up together and trust you in such a revolutionary, radical way that it leads us to worship you in a revolutionary and radical way. Because you are our great God, our great King. We ask these things, we pray these things. In Jesus' name. Let us all say together, amen. amen. Can we put our hands together real big?